Thank you. Hey, hi, everybody. Just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to get tuned in here. Um, please share in the chat where you're joining us from today. We'd love to hear where everybody is. a lot of Irish surnames, love that. Venice, Florida, welcome. Clovis, California. Niagara, Canada, hello Canada. Long Island, New York. Dublin, Boise, Idaho, San Francisco, wow. Madison, Wisconsin. I've got somebody from Cork. Indianapolis, hello. Seattle, wow, Madrid, Spain, covering a lot of bases here. New York City, hello. Hamilton, Ontario, Nebraska, Los Angeles, wow. <laughs> Delaware, I think we might get all 50 states by the look of things. St. Paul, Minnesota, the land of snow, apparently. <laughs> I've heard that too. Detroit, Michigan. All right, it's great to have so many people, wonderful. Just give another minute here for everyone to join us. I am going to drop a link in the chat here so you can all see where you can purchase the book if you'd like to support the book today. I'm going to just drop that in the chat and that will take you to the Book Larder website where you can purchase a signed copy. So look for that in the chat. Right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone, hello. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nisha and I'm the assistant manager here at Book Larder in Seattle, Washington. Our bookstore, if you don't know about us already, is all cookbooks and food writing. We also do cooking classes and author talks uh, like the one we're doing today. Um, we started doing our author talks virtually during the pandemic and it's been really nice to keep doing them because like today, we can chat with people who we might not otherwise get to gather with. So today we're spanning Seattle to Minneapolis to Cork in Ireland. So very global Zoom today. Um, and it's so nice to connect with everybody all over. So we are very excited to be joined by J.R. Ryle, who is joining us from Ballymaloo today, the day before St. Patrick's Day, uh, for those of you not aware. Um, we are celebrating his stunning debut cookbook, Bali Malu Desserts, which you can kind of see here. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulties there. Um, JR is the longtime pastry chef of Bali Malu House in County Cork, Ireland, which, if you don't already know, is an iconic Irish restaurant and cookery school and farm. Um, a major culinary destination in Europe and has a very, very famous dessert trolley, which you will learn more about today and more about in the book. Um, so those of you who have already purchased the book know that it is as stunning as the desserts themselves. Beautiful photography, um, beautiful color celebration of all things Irish and sweet. Um, so I put the link in the chat today and you'll be able to follow that to purchase the book. Um, JR is going to be joined a conversation by Zoe Francois, baker and best-selling author behind Zoe Bake. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with her beautiful creations and her many books, including Zoe Bake's Cakes. Um, we're going to make some time at the end of their chat for questions. So if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box, which is on your Zoom toolbar. Um, 
We will also have closed captions enabled if that's helpful to you, and you can toggle those using the live transcript button on your screen. And lastly, uh, the talk will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel in the next day or two. So if you have to skip out before the end, you can watch it back on our YouTube or you can share it with anyone or share it with the many people who you'll be trying to convince to visit Ballymaloo with you after this talk. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to JR and Zoe. So I'm gonna have them join us now. Hi. Hello. Hi, JR, how are you? Hi, Zoe, I'm great. Uh, greetings from Ballymaloo. Thank you so much. Um, it's so incredible to finally meet you because I've actually been to Ballymaloo twice and never got to meet you. So it's hilarious that this is our first encounter. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think the last time we literally crossed in the air. I remember I yeah. knew you were here and I was getting on my flight in London thinking, I bet you're getting on your flight. <laughs> so it's very nice to be meeting you here. Yeah. So thank you to everyone at Book Larder for organizing this. I know it, it's such um, an honor um, to uh, to get to talk to you about this absolutely stunning, gorgeous book. Um, I read it from cover to cover and um, like I said, I had been to Ballymaloo and um, I posted a picture yesterday on Instagram of your trolley. Um, and I, you know, when I was reading it, I read David Tannis's, um description of the place, uh, not only the restaurant, but where you're from. So he described it as a magical village by the sea. And unless you've been there, um, you don't quite understand just how magical it is. So I was, I think it's so much a part of the book and part of your desserts, that place. So I was wondering if you could just describe it to people. Yeah, I think David does sum it up actually. And uh, like you say, unless you're here, it's um, even when you read about it, I think it's quite hard to imagine. Um, everything here is on quite a small scale. So at the moment, uh, just to tell you where I am, I'm in a little wooden cabin between a centuries old wall garden and a two acre orchard. And we're adjacent to Ballymaloo House. So Ballymaloo House is uh, the biggest house in this area. Uh, the land around it is called the Ballymaloo Farm. And that name translates from Ireland or from the Irish language as land of the sweet honey. So that will tell you a lot about the history of the area. Now, the sea is only three kilometers or two miles from here. And there's a small villain, uh, fishing village nearby where day boats come in and lots of local people work around that. Uh, but the land here is very fertile. So uh, the Allens bought Ballymaloo in 1948 and they were horticulturalists. So they were always growing here apples and they had um, lots of orchards, they had glass houses for growing cucumbers and tomatoes, things they were exporting. So all of that was happening in this area before the restaurant opened. Now, if you go just beyond the village, uh, you can do a walk that we call the cliff walk where the land hits the sea and there's a big limestone outcrop. And along there, there's lovely spongy grass where we go and picnic. Um, and then there's Ballycotton Bay, which has an island in the middle of it, uh, just uh, about a half mile out to sea with a lighthouse. So there's lots of little landmarks around and they're all within an arm's reach. So that's sort of that's that's the lo the locale. Yeah, it's um, so I, I just want to tell you a tiny little story about how I came to know Ballymaloo, because before I ever visited, I actually worked um, in an Irish restaurant here in Minneapolis. And um, this was my uh. Bible. <laughs> uh, so this is Myrtle Allen's book. Uh. And um, so I became very familiar with her work um, and her recipes. And then, um, and then had an opportunity to travel to Ireland with Kerrygold, which is one of the uh, things that I wanted to talk to you about because, uh, well, one, let's start with Myrtle. 
Uh, yes. Because in your book, you say that she taught you how to taste, which is very different than saying she taught you how to cook or how to do pastry. So tell us a little bit about who she is and what she meant to you. Yeah, so uh, Myrtle Allen, for anyone who doesn't uh, know the name, was the founder of Ballymaloo as a food business. So her and her husband, Ivan, uh, bought the farm here in 1948. They were farming and uh, 20 odd years later, she thought it was she had enough cooking experience to open a small restaurant and her husband wanted to support her. But he said, you know, Myrtle, if you're to do it, let's do it here in the house. Now, just to paint a picture for anyone who wasn't in Ireland in the 1960s, um, I wasn't, but I, I've got the stories from Mrs. Allen firsthand that it was a different landscape. There weren't very many restaurants to begin with. Uh, the idea for going out for dinner was quite a foreign concept here. Mm. And then the idea that a 40 year old farmer's wife with six children would open a restaurant in the front room of her rural home. You know, this is really eccentric stuff. And then the idea that she would write a menu each day with what's available. We know we now call it farm to table and, you know, it's part of that whole movement. But, you know, Chez Panisse hadn't opened for another seven years at this point when you think about it. So she was really radical and out on her own in doing this. And she was a free thinker and always pursued things that she believed in. And when I first met Myrtle in the early noughties, so over 20 years ago, I'll never forget the feeling. She actually dazzled me. And I don't think there's that many times in your life where someone really dazzles you. And I've never forgotten the feeling. And I think I'm always going to feel that way about her. And then as I got to know her more and more, um, like you mentioned, it's not that she actually, she did teach me how to cook, of course. You know, she taught me how to use a whisk or how to roll the dough and, you know, all of these techniques. But every time we'd make something, we'd stop. And she'd say, OK, we'll cut a slice. We'll take a spoon and we taste it together. And then she'd say to me, what do you think? And there'd be a silence. And I'd have to like come up with something to say to Mrs. Allen. So I call her Mrs. Allen. That's everyone here calls her Mrs. Allen. Even the prime minister calls her Mrs. Allen. So, you know, I'd be on the spot. This is like 15 year old me in the kitchen thinking, oh my gosh, I have to tell Mrs. Allen what I think of this. And, uh, you know, at the beginning I was nervous and then I became more confident and I realized actually maybe it does need a grain of salt or, you know, is it a little bit sweet? You know, who knew that the rhubarb would be so acidic this week? And, you know, all of these things, they build up. Yeah. So that was kind of it, really. Um, I fell into her orbit, I suppose, and I, I've been there ever since. So okay, she was so alive, just to tell people, she her 99th birthday would have been last week. Oh. So, you know, this is someone who, you know, would be pretty much 100 years old. So yeah. she came from a time way before mine, but I just adored her. And so you started cooking in that kitchen at 15. You basically grew yeah. up in that kitchen. I, I did. So I, I always knew about Ballymaloo. It was on my radar. And my earliest memory, actually, well, what I call my earliest memory, um, was meeting Darina Allen. So she founded the cookery school at yes. Ballymaloo. And uh, when I was four, uh, Darina had a show on television called Simply Delicious. And I remember her making an old fashioned fruit cake. So for anyone who doesn't know, that's a cake with lots of dried fruit in it. You know, you bake it for hours at a low temperature, but it's something I love. And it's sort of, um, uh, you know, in Ireland and England, you'll find, you'll find really good ones. So and there's actually one at the back of the book, the Dundee cake. But anyway, I remember watching her make this fruit cake and I was captivated by it. So now my aunt brought me to visit Darina at the cookery school. And at the end of the visit, I met, met Darina and she gifted me a copy of her cookery book and wrote in the cover, for John Robert, who will be a great chef when he grows up, love from Darina Allen, March 1992. So that was 31 four? years ago. And I was four. And now when I see a four year old, I know how young that is. Yeah. But at the time, I felt <laughs> awfully grown up getting a cookery book from, you know, essentially my hero on television. So Amazing. that was the beginning of the Ballymaloo thing for me. But yeah. it, you're right. It was when I was 15 that I actually ended up in the, the pastry kitchen at the house. And I did some work experience. Then they offered me a part time job. I would take a taxi from school to Ballymaloo on Saturday morning, cook for the day and then take a taxi back that evening because I, I the school I went to was good, but it didn't teach us how to cook. And it was something I really wanted to learn. Yeah. And that's when I met Mrs. Allen. And it's sort of, you know, I, I could see a, 
there was a lot more to life than I was learning in school. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and so it was it was interesting to read that not only did she start this, she started it in her home. She essentially wanted to keep it a secret, which I think I is know. hilarious. Well, when, so, <laughs> you know, we, we, would, we spent hours on end in the kitchen beside each other. So at the part of Mrs. Allen's life where I got to know her, uh, she was in her late 70s and you know going into her 80s and she was starting to step back from commitment she had outside of Ballymaloo she was the chairman of lots of committees in Ireland she'd often fly to London for meetings for various things and she was handing those roles over to other people and suddenly had more time in Ballymaloo so mm -hmm. every morning she would come into the pastry kitchen and we would go through the menu of the day and she'd put on a white lab jacket you know and if the jacket went on you knew you'd have her for hours and she'd say right what can I help with you know and you know, this is, you know, Myrtle Allen and, you know, she might start by preparing apples for a tart or, you know, something that couldn't have been done the evening before that there wasn't time to do. And she loved being resourceful and always looking for the job that would make, you know, pragmatic sense to do. So, yeah. um, so we got to spend lots of time. Sorry, what was the question? Actually, I started <laughs> rambling there. <laughs> I was just talking just, about how how she kept this a uh, secret, but you would. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. We'd cook together for hours on end in the kitchen, and I would ask her these questions. And what she said to me was, when she opened the restaurant, she had this awful fear that she'd wake up one morning and look out the window upstairs, and there'd be a line of cars down the front drive, and she wouldn't be able to cook enough food to feed everyone. So when she opened the restaurant first, she didn't advertise it with yeah. the name. She put a, a small advertisement in the local newspaper. It didn't say Ballymaloo. It just said, dine in a historic Irish country house and a phone number. So you'd have to phone up and then she'd tell you how to get there. So it was kind of like a speakeasy, I suppose, before yeah. speak, you know, be yeah. <laughs> before it was mainstream here anyway. So this, you know, and, and then you'd phone up and say, well, you know, can you let us know where you are? And she'd say, yes, you go a mile outside Cloyne, you'll see an entrance and, you know, come up to the house. So she she started very small. There were three tables in the dining room. Oh, you know, it really was. It was, and her daughter was the waitress on the first night, and uh, the nanny because she had several children helped out as well. And Joe Cronin, who was the shepherd, he helped to serve the drinks. So I mean, you know, it sort of sounds like a fairy tale when I tell it like this, or something that's so made up. But you know, it's it's exactly what happened. Yeah, it actually it still very much feels like you are in someone's house. I mean, I think that was what was so endearing about it was you felt like you were dining in her home. Um, but it was very elevated dining. So let me, um, you had mentioned that she would come in and maybe do something with an apple. You spend a lot of time talking about the ingredients. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I discovered when I went to Ireland was um, dairy is not the same all over the world. Um, I come from a dairy state here in, in the US, in Minnesota. I went to Ireland and really discovered dairy. I mean, it's just a totally different experience. Um, I've never had milk like that. I've never had cream or butter. I mean, just talk a little bit about what that is, because it's very Irish. Yeah, well, we're very fortunate with the produce we have on the whole, and it's really down to our climate. You know, we have long summer days and lots of rainfall. So when it comes to the dairy industry, we grow grass very well in Ireland. There's lots of green pasture land all over the country. And fortunately, there's still a tapestry of very small family farms that farm. A lot of them do mixed farming. So they might have some cows for milking uh, or, you know, cattle that they're fattening for beef. They might also have crops, tillage, all of these things on the same small farm. Now we're talking anything from 40 to 100 acres. So I know by the US standards, you know, that's really micro stuff, but uh, I grew up on one of these farms actually. You know, my we had a small herd of 15 cows that we milked every day. We sold the, the milk to a local creamery and we also had crops. So, you know, this was a viable way of life. Now you can see it, you can see it fading out in Ireland, like everything with inflation. Farmer, there's a lot of difficulty for farmers right now. But anyway, that aside, 
um, we do produce wonderful milk. So the cows are out on pasture for most of the year. They're grazing on grass or for a month or two in the winter, they'll graze on silage, which is the fermented grass that the farmers can harvest during uh, summer when they're surplus. So when you take that great milk and uh, just to put it in context of Ballymaloo, actually, we have a micro herd here. So it's about nine Jersey cows. Uh, they, they, they're organic, you know, they, they graze the organic pastures and we milk them once a day. And then the milk, immediately after milking, the warm milk from the cow is separated. That means we skim the cream from the top. And there's so many things you can do with the cream, but of course we churn it into butter. And boy, is it good. <laughs> and when you're used to that butter, you know, it's sort of a benchmark. Um, but then even the milk itself, you know, we use that for making buttermilk. We use that in the traditional soda breads. Uh, we set the milk with a local seaweed called carrageen for a very interesting dessert that surprises lots of people. We call it carrageen moss pudding. Maybe we won't even chat about that later. There's fun yeah. stories around that. Yeah. Um, and of course, we drink the milk raw or we pasteurize it and make yogurt and lots of other things. So it's, um, yeah, we're very lucky. We've got great dairy and it's it's a really prominent flavor. It's quite interesting. A lot of uh, people might be used to tasting things on the continent, you know, in France or Italy. And they, their dairy is very different to ours. Their climate is different and they okay. don't salt the butter. So if you have a, a pastry or a shortbread or something in France, it tastes quite different to when you have it in Ireland because our, our butter is different, but we also mostly salt the butter. Mm. Uh, essentially, it's cured. And that flavor really translates, you yeah. know, whether it's a victoria sponge cake or an apple crumble like it, it's it's a foundation that everything stands on so it's really important yeah uh, to the flavor of our food so it, yeah ballymaloo is um we you know some people joke uh you know bally butter and all of this but um we <laughs> yeah we we really cherish the dairy yeah and um also the fruit um you you had mentioned that you grew up on a farm and you just tell this um, lovely story about the mulberries and an eccentric aunt. Oh um, yeah, my grand aunt. Well, she, she, yeah. was, she was wonderful. She was born in 1919. So she would actually be 104 if she was alive yeah. now. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I, got, I, I suppose I, I should admit I have this thing for older women. I gravitate to them. <laughs> You know, and I just I love <laughs> older female mentors and That's it sounds great. odd, but it's it's a motif in my life. Me and actually too. another person you might know who became almost Diana Kennedy in yeah. Mexico. And yes. I used to pilgrimage to her every year with a fruitcake. But anyway, sorry, I digress. But um, so, yes, my eccentric grand aunt, uh, usually in the late summer, uh, one of her hobbies or pastimes was to bring Nicole and I, Nicole is my sister, uh, out to we called it the donkey field it was a small field beside the house where we had a donkey uh, as a pet and there was a mulberry tree in the middle of the field a 200 year old mulberry tree or it could have been older it was ancient and the the branches hung very low to the ground and they were brittle and broke easily so we would spread cotton sheets under the tree and she'd give us each a broom and we'd a broom handle and we'd have to hit the branches and the berries would fall like rain onto the sheets and we'd drag out the sheets and bring it back to the kitchen and she used to fill the berries into pillowcases and we crush them with our hands. And, you know, literally I'd be as purple as mulberry myself because anyone who's handled mulberries, you know, the juice is wonderful and sticky, but so rich and deep. Yeah. So anyway, we pour the juice into a Demi John's, these glass vessels, and she'd ferment it into wine. But um, though the sentiment is wonderful, the wine was terrible. Is it terrible? Oh, oh no. So we'd have we'd have house plants everywhere around the house. So if she offered someone a glass, they'd have somewhere to you know to, to ditch it into if if they needed to. Um, but anyway, but we all have great memories of it. And I don't know. I think you know there's a lot of romance around children picking fruit, but actually yeah. it really is amazing because you learn a lot. You know mm. about harvest, about seasonality, and you know that was definitely part of a foundation for me because you know some people they're caramel people they love caramels and toffees some yeah. people are the chocolate person like I'm the fruity guy mm -hmm. I just love fruit yeah. um you know whatever it might be yeah I noticed that you do you do a lot with fruit and it's so beautiful and it was I think the thing that first drew me into the trolley because it was just full of these bright mm -hmm. colors um, one of the things I would love for you to talk about with the trolley is how you decide what's going to go on it, um, because it is a 
like a painting of color, of texture, uh, you know, and it seems like it's so purposeful. You, I was lucky enough to have every single thing on the trolley. Um, and I feel like you almost have to do that because I feel like it's curated in such a way that you have to have every bite. But then uh, you serve uh, pedophores and um, biscuits after that. <laughs> and I hadn't paced myself well. So that's, that's just that's just in case someone has a little room left at the end. But um, yeah, so uh, I'll actually I'll describe the trolley as well in case anyone isn't familiar with it. I, I know in the US people generally call it a cart. Uh, but uh, this side of the Atlantic, we'd normally call it a trolley. So it's a piece of furniture. It's got four wheels. And in the evening, you know, it roams from table to table in the dining room. Um, in old fashioned um, money, we used to call it the trolley dolly. But, you know, now it, it's the server who brings the trolley around. And uh, the, essentially in Ballymaloo, um, the trolley is a snapshot of the day. So there's always five desserts on it. Uh, but we change them every day. Now, there is a sixth dessert that's always there, and that's the carrageen moss pudding. I'll describe that last. So when it comes to planning the menu for what's going to be on the trolley, I use a template. There's always some sort of pastry. So it could be a tart, a tartlet, a galette. It, it might take the form of a cake as well. So something in that category. There's always something frozen. It could be an ice cream, a sorbet, a bomb, you know, an Alaska. There's lots of different things. Whenever we serve ice cream, uh, we ball it and we put it into a bowl cast out of ice and practically it creates a pocket of cold air in the trolley so the ice cream doesn't melt. Then there's always a fruit option. So the fruit could be a platter of figs that have just been picked in the evening. Uh, it could be raspberries from the canes. This time of year we're making citrus fruit salads with lovely citrus from Sicily and Spain. Uh, tonight on the dessert trolley uh, there's a there's a rhubarb compote made with champagne rhubarb grown in the dark so it's so bright and vibrant and uh, so you know depending on the time of year the fruit will change of course uh, then there's always a meringue because with so many desserts we use egg yolks and if you love to make things with yolks even not desserts you know your favorite emulsion sauce say you love to whip up a bernaise in your sleep you know you've got a problem and it's egg whites and the solution is to make a meringue so every night we have a meringue on the trolley it could be anything from um, a, mer a meringue roulade to a gâteau, you know, meringue sandwich like a cake, or even something a little bit more elevated like a gâteau marjolaine. And then there's always something moussey. That's the fifth category. So it, it could be it could be like an orange mousse with chocolate diamonds. It could be a panna cotta layered with jelly. Um, there's lots of different things that could be as well. So essentially, when planning the menu with these five dishes that I have to pick, uh, I need to make sure that if someone has a little bit of everything like you did, and I love that you did, because that's the that's the plan that goes into, it. you know, we want it like that. Uh, that if someone has a little bit of everything, all the various things will complement. And it's not like they have to match up in a particular jigsaw way. It's just that they're nice to eat together or alongside each other. So there's a kind of an informality to it. You know, there's no skid marks or foams. I'm not trying to do something that someone couldn't do for themselves. But uh, it's just to make sure that everything is lovely in mm -hmm. that Irish country house style. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, you know, if you are full after dinner and the trolley comes around, you might just have a little of one thing and that might be perfect for you. But if you're a dessert person and you do have a little bit of everything, you know, it'll tick the box for that guest. Too. So the trolley is really versatile because you can actually end up with a lot of different plates of food from it, depending what you go for. You could eat light or you can go for the whole show. And, um, oh, and I love that. Show. You have to. Yeah. Um, okay, so one thing um, about your desserts is that because I knew Myrtle's work before, um, I had the um, exceptional pleasure of having your desserts. You definitely, it's an ode to her, but they're very much yours. And I would love for you to talk about how you took such an icon's menu and honored her, but also made it your own. 
Um, well, and I should just mention Mrs. Allen's book that you held up, actually. So that was originally written in 1977, and it's still in print. So to have a book in print, you know, spanning over five decades is really an achievement. And it's, yeah. it's for Ireland, it's a really important food manuscript. She captures what was happening at a particular time with her very astute opinion. So a lot of what I did to um, when I was writing Ballymaloo Desserts, the point of the book was never to uh, ride a trend. If anything, I was being really trend resistant. And, you know, I, I wasn't slipping yeah. tahini into something or it wasn't to tweak and twist. I was actually trying to distill down to the bones, mm -hmm. you know, what it takes to, um, to keep Ballymaloo going with desserts for a year. And yeah. I must say a huge thank you to Emily Kudes, the commissioning editor for the book, because in the very first meeting I had with her, um, be before actually, before I knew I was working with Fiodon, we, we were just talking. And she said to me, I want the book to feel like a breath of fresh air when people open yeah. it. And that was something I really wanted to do in, in what I, the way I imagined working with this content. And uh, you know, as a cook as well, Zoe, there's, it's quite hard to actually invent things. And you know, who invented the sponge cake or who invented the creme brulee? You know, and someone might do a sauterne version and someone might do an orange version. And in a way, I wasn't really trying to turn the book into like, here are all my twists on things. It was more, I wanted to come up with the version that's most useful for us in the kitchen. And then I thought that would be useful for other people too. Yeah. Um, so the book is, it's almost like a guidebook for how, you know, we get through each season in Ballymaloo. Yeah. So, um, so it was, it was a real honor to be able to take so much shared content at Mrs. Allen, because, you know, I, I looked up to her. I still look up to her so much. And uh, to be able to, uh, use some of those recipes and then add other ones to them or, or even to in very simple ways elevate dishes you know bring them into a time yes. but almost by refining them by leaving things out rather than putting things in um, and one thing I was always uh, Mrs Allen was wonderful on flavor but when we did cook together um, I was often better at making things prettier <laughs> uh -huh. so yeah. and uh, I don't mean it in any big-headed way but you know I, I was it was always I was I was good on aesthetic so yeah. I loved being able to take dishes that have been around the block for, you know, decades and be able to give them a, con a contemporary look without actually changing any of the components. So that was also another element of it, really to bring things that I think are wonderful to an audience who might otherwise overlook them because they seem dated. Yes. So, yeah. So one of the things that I want to talk about is that, that you can see all the things that oh, I love that. <laughs> Um, is that some of these recipes are very Irish um, and so beloved in Ireland, but not that well known here in the States um, and perhaps mm -hmm. other places in the world. Some things like um, the posset out of your book, which I actually made. Um, oh, I love that. Oh, which yeah, great. Is, um, one of the simplest, most delicious recipes anybody can imagine making. I'd love for you while I eat this, mm. <laughs> I'd love for you to tell people <laughs> what it is um, and yeah, sort of describe it. While yeah, I so, and in a way that the lemon pasta, <laughs> it, it sums up the Ballymaloo style, you know, where that's a three ingredient dish. Yeah. It's cream, sugar, and lemon juice. Yes. So. Uh, to be able to create a dessert probably in, you know, five minutes, you know, anyone who's into making coffee with their Chemex or whatever, you know, they're going to spend that much time making a cup of coffee. But in the same amount of time, you can have a dessert ready, you know, in the fridge for supper that evening. So with the posset, uh, you boil sugar and cream and then stir in lemon juice and then you chill it and it sets. And the, the richer the cream, the thicker the set. That's generally the rule. Yes. So if I use the Jersey cream from the farm here, you know, it's literally liquid gold when you're pouring it, you know, it, it falls in slow motion. It's so thick. But when you make the pasta with that, you know, it's got this, you can cut it with a knife. But yeah. then if you use a thinner cream, you'll have a slightly, you know, a softer, silkier texture. So even mm. with these things, you know, they'll change from my kitchen to yours. But the concept mm. of these really simple dishes, I mean, I love that uh, something that I'd want to do at home is something I can also do in the restaurant. You yeah, know, and it's just sort of the way we want to eat all the time. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, I wanted to make something um, from the book and um, I had all of those ingredients. Literally five minutes later, mm -hmm. it was done. So I yeah. love that you have um, 
some cakes that maybe are, you know, layered up and a little bit more of a project. And then there's super simple things. Okay. You mentioned the Caribbean pudding. Yeah. Um, uh, it was uh, when I got off of the bus at Ballymaloo. Um, it was the very first thing that I ate and I will never be the same. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you liked it. Um, Amazing. Yeah, for, for me, actually, if if I had to, uh, some someone once asked me, you know, if the book was on fire, what page would I rip out? <laughs> And well, actually, after David Tannis's forward, because I must say, when I got yeah. my hands on the very first copy of the book, I, I opened that page and read it. I actually cried a little. I had no yeah. idea the emotion one would feel around, you know, actually holding it in my hands. Uh, but anyway, uh, so maybe the forward, because that was just so dear to my heart. But uh, it would be the carrageen moss pudding recipe. So now I'll, I'll just I'll describe it for a moment, because unless you're from Ireland or even people in Ireland may not have grown up with it as a household dish at home, but they, they'll probably have heard of it. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the word carrageen translate, translates in the Irish language uh, to little rock. So carrageen moss translates as little rock moss. Now, I think that's terribly romantic and lovely. <laughs> so this is a seaweed. It's about the size of a closed fist and it grows natively on all the little rocks around the coast of Ireland. And the tradition is um, that usually, or Mrs. Allen's preference was always, during the first two weeks of July, when there was a spring tide, that's when the tide goes lower than any other time because, you know, the moon has an effect on tides. And when it drops lower, we would wade out into the water and pick the small clusters of carrageen moss from the rocks. And then we'd lay it out on the cliff top or on some bouncy grass and the sun would dry it and the rain would wash it. And it's this time honored process for naturally preserving the seaweed, the carrageen moss. So then once it's dried, and bleached. When I say bleached, uh, I should say that when you pick the seaweed, it's sort of an iridescent brown color. Mm -hmm. After it's bleached, it's white. And this just happens by leaving it outdoors. It's really a beautiful process to observe over a couple of days. So then we bring in the dried seaweed and we have enough for the year and it keeps indefinitely. I've found bags of it tucked away in presses and suitcases, you know, years later, and it, it's absolutely perfect. So if you do pick your own, you know, you, you'll, um, you'll use every bit of it. And then we simmer the seaweed in milk and it gives it a very soft set. And like these old fashioned puddings, there's very little sugar in it. So in one batch of the pudding, there's two tablespoons of sugar. And this is enough for, you know, eight or 10 people. So like, this is like really low sugar territory. And yeah. it's not for health reasons, actually. It's because that gets the right flavor, uh, which is a really good point to make about sugar, actually. You know, not, it's to get the flavor right. And not, it's not about calorie balance, but actually this is sort of like a low fat, low sugar dessert and on its own it's quite it's got um, a lovely soft silky set texture and a gentle scent of the sea in the flavor and we add a tiny bit of vanilla as well which complements it and to serve it then um, we would pair it usually with a fruit compote so in autumn or fall we might have poached plums at this time of year it's just exceptional with the rhubarb and yes. um, when we come to June and July, we'll have green gooseberries with wild elderflowers poached to a compote. That's also in the book. Um, that goes wonderfully with carrageen. So all of these simple fruit dishes can accompany these set creams so well, or even anything that you would serve with a creme caramel or a creme brulee, that's going to go well with the carrageen. So you can think of it like that. Yeah. But um, desserts like that, interestingly, because they go back so far in tradition, and people have been making versions of this for hundreds of years in Ireland, um, you know, they were eaten for sustenance as well as pleasure. You know, they weren't made just as a confection. You know, the idea that you could eat a little seaweed, it's high in iodine and minerals, you know, it's it's actually a really good thing to have in your diet. So as well as being a joyful dessert, uh, it's fortifying. So that meant a lot to Mrs. Allen because mm. she always saw food as the medicine. And she believed if you fed your children good food, and you felt the, fed those around you good food and ate it yourself, that actually, you know, that was the best medicine you could have. Now, of course, we all get sick, but, you know, it's a great place to start. And things like the carrageen moss pudding, those simple dishes, you know, that have a quality to them. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to serve them in a restaurant. So yeah, that's the one dish we have on every night. It seems like that's very much a philosophy of Ballymaloo is it's not just about the food. It's about your environment and sustainability and 
you know, and delicious food that's all local and seasonal. And I love too that you are clearly a master at your craft and that you. you share all of your little secrets. You have these like quiet little moments in the corners here, <laughs> these tiny little type. Everybody has to get this book and you have to read all those tiny little notes because that's the gold for me. Because you have shared, like I ate off of that trolley and I was like, how did he do that? <laughs> and I've been <laughs> well, baking a you. very long time. And it's like you, you talk about in one um, area of the book, um, notes on um, light, airy texture. Oh yeah, I know, yeah, Ad adding lightness, yeah. Adding lightness to a dessert. And I was just like, I was so moved. <laughs> but there's, I mean, there's so much of that. It's not just that the recipes are gorgeous and the book is stunning. I, you did such a beautiful job, but you also share so much of yourself. And honestly, that's not always the case with a restaurant based book. And home cooks aren't always able to get in there and recreate what they've had. But in this one, You've really shared everything and it's really generous of you. Oh, thank you. Well, well, that was always my aim. And um, I must make a shout out to the photographer as well, Kleena Prendergast. Uh, it yeah. was her first book as well. And Kleena uh, lives in Connemara in the west of Ireland. And uh, so beautiful. When, when, it, when it came to uh, choosing the photographer and I was talking to Emily and the team of Fidon and, uh, the, you know, they, they want to know who, who, who could I dream of? And... Actually, Kleena was the only Irish photographer I could have dreamt of working with. And she's the only name I put forward. And I was delighted when they approved her. But so I would, I cooked each dish and styled it and Kleena shot it. And we did it over seven different small photo shoots in the old house in Ballymaloo. Yeah. And it was so lovely to gradually see everything come together. But I knew by doing it that way and doing it myself with a friend that if someone follows the recipe, you know, the, the photographs, a true illustration of it. It wasn't done in a studio or a set somewhere. You know, right. this is if, if you get if you get the best butter and you, you know, you have just picked cherries. That's what the desserts will really look like yeah. um, or could look like, you know, and I in a way I wanted the images to look like what a 12 year old me would have loved to have gotten my hands on because I loved <laughs> studying a photo. Like when I look at the photos in your book, Zoe, they're so inspirational. And I would study it and I'd say, how did that marshmallow land in the other one? You know, and I'd try and recreate it. So I wanted the photos to be really clear, you know, so that yeah. the detail would come across. But Kleena did that so beautifully. And Emily's vision for the book then just pulled everything together. Was, yeah. yeah, it's it's a stunning book. Yeah. Um, like you saw, I have so many <laughs> recipes um, I'm that so I'm going to, to make. Um, and just congratulations. It's just, it is... Um, in a book form, your desserts at the restaurant, you really pulled it off. And um, I hope that everybody has an opportunity to go and have you bake for them, but they have this to Yes, do well, I'd love to see home. everyone and, and send me a message if you're coming, you know, and let me know the day. And if I'm free, I'll bring you around the garden. I always love to meet anyone who's got an extra interest in desserts. Um, yeah. I, I think you're gonna have a lot of takers on that one, JR. <laughs> I hope <laughs> so. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, what a wonderful conversation. Well, we have a couple of questions that I would love to put to you both. So the first question, and I, you know, the answer to this one may have been covered already, but um, Morgan is wondering what is the most nostalgic recipe for you from your book? And, you know, that may be the, the carrageen and moss pudding that you have described so beautifully, but is there anything particular that, you know, Mrs. Allen shared with you or oh do you know there were a lot of recipes we had to leave out of the book as well so uh, most of the ones that ended up in there have some element of nostalgia but definitely the carrageen moss pudding because it was it was a comp I had never really understood desserts like that growing up my mother cooked uh, lovely simple desserts for us she'd make lemon meringue pies or fresh butter sponges and they're wonderful and I was very familiar with them and um, so I have great nostalgia and that level and she'd make beautiful rice puddings and you know I'm very nostalgic about those things too of course but when I came to Ballymaloo and uh, saw things like the carrageen moss pudding that were really connected to the area 
you know, and the the climate and what was going on. Um, I suppose in a way the memory of those is so great that I think yeah that that has to steal the place for one of my most nostalgic ones. Yeah, definitely. Um, and aside from the Carrageen and Moss, is there is there one dessert in the book that you would love for people to try, especially if they might not be familiar with it? Oh well, I think if someone wants to spend an afternoon in the kitchen. Um, I would probably direct them to, I'm just going to find the picture of this now. Um, it's panna cotta layered with coffee jelly. And it's something I invented for a dinner in the glass house one day. Uh, we were doing this dinner for 100 people. And uh, so essentially you make panna cotta and you make coffee jelly and you set them layer by layer in a glass dish. And now actually my friends at Jura Point uh, Glass Blowing Studio make these beautiful bowls as well. So it's really nice to be able to use a friend's bowl and make a a fun striking dessert but if you do have a lovely bowl at home it's a really one fun to a really fun one to try because you'll surprise yourself in what you can achieve you know your guests will look at it and they'll just be mesmerized and it's also a really good one to eat it's like an after dinner coffee so i think that'd be a fun one if someone really wants to try and push the boat out yeah give that a give that a whirl yeah that one looks amazing um we have someone who is actually going to be visiting bali malu in june so they're wondering yeah. what kind of things they might expect to see on the trolley around that time. Uh, well, June is a lovely shift in season. It's really when the summer kick starts. We'll be picking the first green gooseberries. The hedgerows are going to be frothy with elderflowers. So that will be going into everything. We'll still be in uh, high rhubarb season, which some people say you still have rhubarb in June and July. We have a very old variety here and we pick it almost up until August. So we have plenty of rhubarb. Uh, all of the lovely herbs will start coming back in the garden. Then the sweet geranium, the lemon verbena, which is usually the latest herb to produce leaves, uh, the sweet Sicily. So all of those flavors will work their way into the desserts. Um, we might be lucky enough to have the first cherries. They're usually later June. You can get beautiful apricots from Provence that come up through the importers. So we love to get our hands on a few of those too. So yeah, June is great. Um, I can't, I'm look forward to you being here. And the days are so long in June as well. You know, it's just, yeah, it's a really good time to come and visit. Oh yeah, look at that beautiful photo Zoe's showing us there, gorgeous. Yeah, actually everything in that photo I picked in 20 minutes by walking around oh, the garden that day. <laughs> because I was bringing stuff into the kitchen when we were, I was doing the photo shoot with Kleena and I just had, I put it all out in a tray. I was like, oh my gosh, like, let's just get a photo of this. I didn't know it would end up in the book, so um, but I'm, I'm really happy it did because it is a snapshot of in one day, in a few minutes, you can gather all of these things. You know, we have 10 different pear varieties growing on every wall of the place. You know, it, we're so lucky to be able to focus on the shapes and flavors of the way different varieties are, you know, and it's, I suppose that's what makes Ballymaloo different. Our food is plain, but we're so connected to the surroundings that that really reflects on the plate then. You know, and it's, you know, and someone might say, oh, I think it tasted different last week. You know, and they think it's the same dish. And you say, well, actually, you know, it's because it was a different pair. And it's, you know, I, that for me, that's really cool. I, yeah, I just, and, and that someone might notice and they might have a preference or, you know, it's, yeah, I, that's, yeah, I love that. So, yeah, but June is a great, for that question, the answer is, yeah, June's a great month. We have lots for you. Wonderful. And someone is also wondering uh, in the US, is it possible to source ingredients? For the, the carrageenan and moss pudding and things like um, gooseberries, I think you, you can get, you know, depending on where you are in the US, things like that. But specifically the carrageenan and moss pudding, is it possible to, to recreate that here? Uh, it is. So actually, um, over a year ago, I was in L.A. Uh, visiting David, who David Thomas, who wrote the forward for the book. And um, he asked me, would I pop into the kitchen at Lulu in the Hammer Museum where he is cooking and he, he runs the kitchen there? And if I'd make a dessert, because Alice Waters was coming for a couple of days, and I thought, I want to make carrageen moss pudding. And I thought I had a bag in my suitcase, because I always bring it with me. And I actually left it in New York on the way. It fell out in, my, in the spare room my friend's house. So I did manage to get some carrageen moss in mm -hmm. Erewhon, this shop in LA. So it's mm -hmm. there. You know, if you go out to health food stores, it's sometimes called Irish moss. Um, or carrageen moss or carrageen and there's different names people put on it I think um, some of the online retailers uh, the big ones which I know whether we love them or not uh, they might be able to help you get your hands on some but if you come to Ireland we'll go pick it together and I'll show you and you can bring some dried back in your bag how about that <laughs> there's going to be a big crowd of people yeah. following yeah. you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but I should say with all the recipes 
you know, I use real ingredients that are accessible anywhere. Yeah, there's very little in the book, I think, that someone might. The carrageen is probably the one thing. Apart from that, I think everything is within reach of most people. You know, bar one or two fruits that you mightn't have in your state. I don't know if every state does grow gooseberries, but, you know, chances are uh, you could find them. Yeah. The one that's actually hard to find is rhubarb because it oh. doesn't grow um, in the southern states. Oh, well, and there are a couple of rhubarb recipes in the book, but a lot of the recipes I should mention, I call them blueprints. It's mm -hmm. like there's always something you can swap it in or out with. So like the rhubarb custard tart could be an apple custard tart or an apricot custard tart or a cherry. And in the head notes of the recipes, I often mention these variations that I love, you know, or the, the gooseberry tartlets, these small little bite size, almost like a canapé gooseberry tartlet. I make a rhubarb, an apple, a uh, cherry and a... Uh, an apricot version. So these recipes, when you when you dive into the notes I make, it does tell you, you know, there's often something else you can use. So if you like the idea of the dish, um, do do read the little bit I write on top. Uh, even these, you know, you could do them with bilberries or uh, boysen berries or top them with strawberries. There's there's always something to hand. And again, again, that's the Ballymaloo way. You know, um, even though in the book I present my favorite version of each each dish, um, they get varied through the year. And here's a here's a great question and a very timely one for St. Patrick's Day, mm. which is tomorrow. Um, someone is wondering, do you have a favorite soda bread recipe? There are so many soda bread recipes in Darina's books, but is there is there one you make most often? Um, yeah, so, talk a little yeah. Bit. So I make loaves of soda bread in Ballymaloo every morning, um, and and if I'm not in, my colleagues make it. So we make them as breakfast breads, mm -hmm. and the most traditional loaf is made with whole wheat flour. So I can call out the recipe, it's so easy. Half a pound of whole wheat flour, half a pound of plain white flour, a level teaspoon of salt and bread soda, mix it together and bind it with buttermilk, shape it and bake it, that's it. So you literally have it mixed in three minutes, you'll dirty one bowl in one hand and you'll have a loaf of bread in the oven. No kneading, no handling. It's such a good daily thing. So I grew up in it. Um, my great aunt, the, the eccentric mulberry picker, she used to make a loaf of soda bread every day at home for us. Um, and we would use sour milk, some milk that was brought into the house from the parlor. If it ever went sour naturally, she'd use it up by mixing it into the bread. So um, yeah, that's a great one for St. Patrick's Day. You can even make it with all white, all purpose flour if you want a white loaf. It's a pound of flour, teaspoon of salt soda, and a bind of buttermilk, and that's it. Amazing. And I think we have time for, for about one last question. And selfishly, it will be mine, which is, <laughs> I am wondering what is going to be on the dessert trolley tomorrow for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, yeah, so given that it's St. Patrick's Day, we go quite traditional and do play on the theme. So it's going to be brown bread ice, ice cream, which actually mightn't sound so traditional to many people. I guess it's not. But in a way, it's a way of using up surplus brown bread that we have. We toast the bread with sugar and vanilla. So it caramelizes almost like a praline and then break it up and fold it into vanilla ice cream. Oh my God, so good. Uh, we're gonna make the Irish apple cake. So that's a traditional um, cake baked on a plate. So it's quite flat. It's actually, it's very near the back of the book. And uh, so that's a lovely kind of soft, almost like a scone mixture with lots of lovely apple broken down inside in it. And for that, I'd use a Bramley apple, an apple variety we love here that breaks down to a foamy mass and it's lovely and acidic. So there'll definitely be the Irish apple cake. And you'll find different versions of that cake all across the country, but uh, that's one that I particularly like. Uh, we'll have a rhubarb compote. So I'm gonna pick some of the first stems of rhubarb from the walled garden. It, it's the first crop of the year. So that's exciting and it's going to be really flavorful. That'll pair with the carrageen moss pudding. So again, sticking very Irish with all of this. And um, then I'm actually gonna make some little chocolate mousses that almost look like Guinnesses. Sounds a little tacky, but it's fun. Um, where I'll set a little layer of white chocolate mousse on top of dark chocolate mousse. And then today, Beth, who works with me in the pastry kitchen, she was playing around with making pistachio shortbreads, which are going to be like green and white, kind of like little checkerboards that we can serve with them. So, you know, that's really just to have a bit of fun with the theme as well, because there's no point in being all serious. It's a celebration. And, uh, you know, the whole country is going to go wild tomorrow. Uh, so it's fun to, to have a little nod to it on the trolley. <laughs> that's very fun. It sounds very colorful yeah. and very beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, and the Irish so coffee, Moran Gatto, of course. Yeah. So it's oh, also yes. in the book. Yeah, that I mean, was, Irish coffee. Yeah. That was Sorry, the first thing that. I made from the book. Yeah. Was oh, and this it looked one. so good, Zoe. It was so it's beautiful. So when you delicious. Made it. I love it.
And yes. uh, yeah, so that's like coffee meringue sandwich with a boozy whiskey cream. So a fun play on the Irish coffee, not one for the kids, maybe. Um, but yeah, so so that's tomorrow night's trolley. Yeah. So if anyone wants to come and join us, you'll be able to try a bit of everything. <laughs> I think so we're all staff, to say a huge thank the you. airport right now. <laughs> it's, it's been so nice being on talking to you today. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, just, it's fun like, that we ended on the Irish coffee meringue gateau because I feel like that's a great expression of both of your styles and both of your expertise in, in meringue and all that wonderful artistry that you both do. Um, well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, JR, from Zooming in all the way from Cork. Zoe, all the way from Minneapolis. We're so glad to have you all. And I put a link in the chat to where you can purchase um, JR's book from our website and also Zoe's book, Zoe Bake. Um, we are lucky enough to have signed copies of both of those. <laughs> and there you can see Zoe's book. <laughs> a few wonderful master classes. Yeah. <laughs> little book um, well, thank you so much, everybody. And once again, we did record this talk, so it will be on YouTube, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow on the Book Larder channel. So you can watch it back and grab that soda bread recipe and share it with anyone. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Bye-bye. Best wishes. Bye.